you all. Um, there are questions. I don't quite know how many we'll get through, uh, but I, I'll put some. Um, first of all, really, I guess, heading for Sven, uh, they're not the questions as put, but there's in my interpretation of them, is, uh, Sven, would you like to say why the design wind speeds jump across national boundaries? Do you know anything about the reasons that have resulted in that? Yeah, of, I, I think there, you can hear me? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I think there are, there are many reasons, um, but you can say all the wind speeds are based on historical data. So in principle, uh, we should have good consistency across borders, but we don't have that at the moment. And that must be the, it could be the conservatism used by some countries. It could be the, the models um, are not exactly the same. Uh, and that's the reason for the new annex on how to estimate extreme wind speeds. We have an annex showing that we have non-consistencies. And the, instead of just showing that, we would add, like to add how to calculate extreme wind speeds. Okay, thank you. And associated with that, um, uh, with the Eurocode again, uh, I read CFD can predict QST forces quasi steady, I guess, quite well, exactly. For example, for bridges, so why not allow the usage if validated? Uh, how I think they arrive at the uh, general non-usage of CFD for forces. I think that's that's a very good question, uh, and that annex where we uh, compare wind tunnel testing and CFD analysis um, has been uh, dealt with in detail. We have uh, done a lot of um, of uh, of investigations into uh, uh, the, 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 the wind tunnel testing and the CFD calculations. Um, and I, I know that the CFD in some, in some cases can give you a good uh, cross-sectional force, for instance. Uh, and it is used for bridges sometimes. But, but then again, if you have a cable supported bridge with a substantial span, I don't think no that there will be an engineer in the world daring not to go to the wind tunnel with that cross section. Right. Thank you. Um, one or two, these probably need just very quick answers about the Eurocode. Um, it, someone asks, does it provide for maximum acceptable accelerations? I don't believe it does, but you might say no, something. No, no. no. It's uh, just has, is there anything about helical strakes on chimneys in there? There are a little bit. Um, the, the, the force coefficient when you have helical strikes are mentioned, but there's no clear guidance on, on helical strikes. Okay. There, um, is a, there is a warning about if you have a generalized school number very low, you can have problems with the helical strikes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and again, a quick one uh, from Claudia Menini. Um, are the estimated values of straw numbers, presumably that's for the chimney work, uh, but also other aerodynamic coefficients uh, not shown in the presentation, are these based on realistic turbulence flows? I think um, many of the coefficients, yes, are based on realistic turbulence flows um, simulated in the wind tunnel uh, and also for some full scale investigations. But of course, there are also values based on uh, laminar flow. So, it's, it, so there could be cases where the turbulence, uh, the influence of, of turbulence has not been taken accurately into account. Okay, right, thank you. Um, a, a question for John Dora. Uh, John, would you care to say a little more about these adaptive codes, how they might work? Uh, just open up the concept a bit more. I'm not quite sure I get it. Yeah, I, th I think one of the um, the concerns with looking at any kind of code because it has a sort of life of maybe 10 years is that once you write something and put it there, it's set in stone and the climate is changing rather rapidly. So something that's designed today to the current Euro codes it tends to be basing it, its, its sort of weather parameters on, on snow loading, wind loading, 
and thermal effects on the 1961 to 1990 climate, which is way out of date for current conditions. So, so having a, a code that permits users to use future data that hasn't been derived yet is one of the aspirations. How we go about that, it's a form of words that needs agreed across all the standards bodies across Europe and the, the technical committees um, will be working on that. Um, the, the thing that we do see is with people like Copernicus Climate Services and the Climate Data Store, there's some really quite good granular data with information around it, talking about uncertainties, that engineers can use because we're good at understanding data, but there isn't provision in the current codes to permit that kind of data to be used. So it's having some sort of format that Schwend mentioned that allows future data or current data that hasn't been sort of recognized in current standards. So users, designers can make use of that data. Does that make sense? No, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I should have listened properly in the first place. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, thank you, thank you, John. Um, one or two things about the US situation now as they're, they're coming through to me. Um, um, I have to read, I'm afraid. I'm not quite sure what this means. Similar to the empirical curve by Velosi and Cohen, will there be any resource in ASCII 722 to convert, compare maximum radial velocity of a thunderstorm, usually referred to a 30 second averaging time to a three second gust, the basic wind speed? Uh, this conversion might be useful for performance-based wind analysis in the Midwest. Donald, uh, I, I, I've read what was there. I, I'm not quite sure I understand the nuances of it. Certainly, Chris. Uh, the curve is not provided in the commentary of ASCE. It's in the resource that uh, Frank Lombardo did. So the, in the research paper that was referenced in, in the commentary, you will find that, that data in the references. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask a similar, rather stupid question um, uh, of you, Donald, uh, to, to ask for John? Could you define for me performance-based wind engineering? Certainly, it's. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I know what it means, but you know, well, I'd like to be sure. Well, it's uh, it's uh, always a different uh, thing that uh, we we look at, but it's really what you set up with your performance objective. And then you analyze your structure very uh, thoroughly to make sure that you meet those performance objectives. And that might be your performance objectives might be in the um, acceleration, the like I said, the cladding, any one of those items that you choose to um, check, uh, check your objective on. And most of our objectives right now are set up as either accelerations and or drifts is how we we test the main wind force resisting system. Um, and I see one of the things in the chat is really what we look at there is, um, do we require wind tunnel studies to validate what we're doing on a performance yeah, based, so to read that based, based design? We do use the wind tunnel studies that are required. If you're going to do, we need wind time histories to analyze our main wind force resisting systems with, uh, with those and to test those. The one thing that is different between what, at least in the US, and I, I'm not sure if any other code allows in the world to go into the inelastic range or the nonlinear range for materials with performance-based wind design, we do allow the main wind force resisting system to go slightly nonlinear. I want to, when I say slightly, not nearly as much as we do in seismic design, but what we do for wind design, we do allow it to go slightly nonlinear. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to end it there. There are some other questions. I'll, I'll, I'll send all the questions to the authors and I'm sure they can provide quick comments and I'll try and mount, mount those comments on the website in due course. I won't promise that it will come immediately, however. I'd like to thank on your behalf all our speakers today for the contributions they've made uh, and to thank them very much for the time they spent in preparing, preparing the talks. It's very much appreciated. In a normal seminar, I'd ask you to uh, 
uh, offer them applause at this point, but that's not really on at the moment. Um, but my thanks indeed. The recordings of the seminar will go online on sometime in the next 24 hours, I hope, and all people who are registered will get a link to that. Uh, the next seminar uh, on March the 4th, um, if I can uh, share the screen, share a screen with you. The next seminar uh, is not that one. Mm -hmm. um, is on wind-related disaster risk reduction, current status and future prospects. Uh, and only three weeks time, um, uh, first Thursday in March at 12 o'clock. And the main speaker will be somebody many of us here know very well indeed, Professor, Professor Yukio Tamura. So once again, thank you to the speakers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. And I hope you feel it's been worthwhile. And I'll leave that on the screen but I'll now turn off my video and go mute and just let you leave at your own pace. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody.